Good evening, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Dan Frankel, and I am a retiree in lockdown in Cambridge, UK, and I will chair this meeting and the roundtable. My aim is to take as little time as possible from the speakers. One year ago, most of the world went into lockdown as it became clear that COVID-19 had become a global pandemic. Now the pandemic is starting its fourth wave. This in spite of the fact that most people have really tried hard to bring the pandemic under control by complying with rules that are quite tough. The evidence that people were careful is the near total disappearance of the flu. But what was good enough to control the flu is apparently not good enough for COVID-19. Exactly one week ago, an article by Moore et al. appeared in The Lancet. These authors had looked at different scenarios for vaccination and how they would affect the possibility to release all restrictions. Their conclusion, even with the most optimistic vaccination scenarios, vaccination alone cannot contain the outbreak. Hopefully, these predictions are too pessimistic, but they highlight the fact that measures to limit the spread of COVID-19 will be around for some time to come. The efficiency of these measures depends on whether they can effectively target the most important mechanisms by which the virus spreads. One such route is airborne dis dispersion, about there was, which there was much confusion and disagreement. On June 4th, 2020, the Dutch Academy hosted a webinar on the role of airborne dispersion. The speakers, including two of today's speakers, had a background in the physical sciences. In one year, a huge amount of information has been collected. There have been tens of thousands of preprints, many of which informed policy even before they were published. We, and we stands for Detlef Loze from the Physical Fluids Group of the University of Twente, Daniel Bond from the Institute of Physics of the University of Amsterdam, and importantly, Mazi Alal, also from the University of Amsterdam Institute of Physics, who did most of the organization, we thought it would be good to have an assessment by speakers from the biomedical science, sciences, from engineering, from fluid mechanics, uh, on the modern view of airborne spread of COVID-19. A key question for today's seminar is, do we have enough consensus to suggest which policies are best suited to control this pandemic? In parallel with vaccination, we will have six short talks of 12 minutes plus three minutes for questions. After the talk, there will be a roundtable discussion where we will be joined by Ruhl Coutinho, who will give his perspective as an expert on epidemiology and infectious diseases. Now, first, a few house rules about those of you who are on Zoom. Um, you are welcome to send us your questions via Zoom using the Q&A option in the, in the bar below the Zoom screen. If you have spe a specific question for one of the speakers, please start your question by typing the speaker's name. We would like to answer as many questions as possible. I therefore ask you to keep your questions short and to the point. Mazi Yaral will try to group similar questions. Almost certainly, we will not be able to answer all questions. If you're watching on YouTube, then you're watching a uh, direct live stream uh, from Zoom. Uh, and please note that our speakers will not be able to monitor the, the ch chat on YouTube. Uh, these are the house rules. Now, I should say that I'm very happy that the Dutch Academy of Sciences is hosting this seminar, this webinar, and I'm delighted that Martin Kruk, who is a historian, but in this context, importantly, the, the chair of the KNAW Corona Task Force, is willing to say a few words about recent initiatives of the Academy to mobilize scientific expertise on these and other global uh, emergencies. And I now uh, pass the, uh, the screen to uh, Martin Kruk. Martin. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. So I hope I'm visible and you can hear me. Um, Dan, can you confirm that? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, so thank you for uh, having me. 
And um, I will just take two or three minutes of your time to inform you a little bit about what is going on at the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, as uh, Dan already uh, indicated, this webinar is part of a much longer series, and I apologize for the fact that all the titles are in Dutch, uh, but um, uh, this is uh, the list of webinars that the uh, Academy has hosted so far, and there are more coming. Uh, a second activity that the Academy uh, has recently launched, actually, uh, the board has decided on launching three parallel uh, report uh, trajectories. These reports will hopefully appear uh, uh, right after the summer, but before the end of this calendar year. Uh, and they are, uh, well, you can see uh, the, the two titles and the middle one is obviously about the impact of the pandemic on uh, science and uh, the way we work. There is a third um, um, activity, which is uh, advising the uh, directorate, a, um, a, a, a bureaucratic uh, structure uh, overarching the various uh, ministries in uh, The Hague that uh, has the responsibility to advise the government, the Dutch government that is, on uh, the way uh, its policies should apply to uh, the uh, Dutch society as a whole. So this uh, uh, group is not responsible for the pandemic as such. There is a separate organization for that, but uh, they uh, are um, um, busy trying to sort out the uh, societal impact and uh, reflect also on uh, post-pandemic society. This is quite a challenge. We don't have a, a track record in this. And there are obviously all kinds of other institutions that are also advising the government. We, that is the Academy, will uh, uh, launch a, uh, a new initiative in this field, but because it's still uh, undercover, as it were, you'll just have to follow uh, uh, the news uh, for this. All of this, of course, uh, raises uh, broader questions about policy advice and how uh, the academy should go about uh, the business. Uh, I've listed uh, uh, two of them, um, uh, one um, inspired by uh, Dan Frenkel, the second one, uh, who, as he said, operates from the UK, uh, where they have a chief scientific advisor. The Netherlands doesn't. And there is a uh, an interesting debate to be had about whether we should have one or not. And as I say uh, uh, under the final bullet, the uh, uh, Academy Board is considering these issues and uh, members of the Academy uh, uh, in the audience who want to make a contribution to this uh, debate, please write to the president uh, and uh, voice your opinions. This is all I have to say uh, in my two minutes. Thank you for listening. Martin, thank you very much. I know that you're a very busy man, so uh, I would say, I wouldn't say you're dismissed, but <laughs> don't feel <laughs> don't feel embarrassed to leave now. Um, as I said, I will not want to take time from the speakers. I just want to introduce them. So the first talk uh, will be given by Alex Friedrich and Marete Lokate from the Universitaire Medisch Centrum in Groningen, and I'll say a few words about them. Uh, Mariette Locate is infection preventionist and epidemiologist at the University Medical Center in Groningen. She trained as a nurse and then studied health science at the Free University in Amsterdam and then clinical epidemiology at Utrecht University, where she obtained her doctorate in 2012. Her work focuses on prevention of the transmission of microorganisms. Based on her research, she advises hospital staff on the suppression of transmission. During the past year, much of her work focused on the airborne spread of SARS-CoV-2. The second speaker from Groningen, or actually the first, but in, 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 in on my list a sec, uh, is Alex Friedrich, who is a clinical microbiologist and since 2011, chair and head of department of medical microbiology and infection prevention at the University Medical Center in, in Groningen. He, his, he received his medical training at the University of Würzburg, Coimbra, and Rome. 
And uh, in this context, importantly, in 2019, he received the Robert Koch Prize for Hospital Hygiene and Infection Epidemiology. Mariette and Alex will talk about lessons learned from the first year of the pandemic. And uh, I think that Mariette is going to, uh, Alex is going to start. Is that right? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, you will hear Mariette uh, in a minute. I will uh, introduce uh, our uh, talk. Um, thank you very much for inviting us and for this interdisciplinary um, uh, discussion we will have today, um, which is uh, the most important uh, in this uh, lessons I have to draw. So um, thank you, Mariette, that you're um, starting. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, disclosure of speaker's interest and the next. Um, so I will, uh, in three minutes, say three points that are important for the overall talk. Um, next slide. Uh, the hyperspreading. Uh, in the hyperspreading, I think that was a major lesson that we learned that um, there is not only a um, super spreading event, which is obviously uh, known, but that there is a super sh shedding moment. Um, there is the super shedding moment in on onset of disease. And uh, we see that this can even be before onset of disease that you have viral um, load that is enough for transmission. Um, and um, uh, the problem is that we see here even from the data in Italy that reached us very early that depending on your lifetime, um, up to the half or more of the people are asymptomatic at the moment of testing, but they have enough viral loads uh, for transmission. And the problem is if the super shedding moment um, touches the super spreading event, and that's the perfect storm. And that is something that has been underestimated. Uh, and that's an important point. Next is, next to hyper spreading is the over dispersion. So we're talking a lot about uh, half of the people are getting infected at home. But the question is, where does the other half at home get infected? Not also at home, so somewhere else. And so you cannot calculate from my point of view the home infection epidemiologically because everybody has a home. Um, uh, but you have to look at where are the over dispersion uh, uh, happening. And if you look into data, um, and we don't have the data in the Netherlands, but the uh, Robert Koch Institute has um, taken that data from the beginning of the pandemic, from 1st of March, where the uh, over dispersion of uh, transmission in clusters has happened. And we see in the first go uh, wave, it was especially in healthcare institutions. There it happened. Um, and from there, you can specifically have setting specific reproduction numbers. And you see that they match quite well also with data that we have now also uh, from the RAVM in the Netherlands, where you see that in at home, there are in the mean three people that get infected. But in hospitals, there are about 10 people that get infected per event. Uh, and in um, uh, nursing homes, up to 18 or sometimes even 20 in other countries. So that means that healthcare institution, um, from my point of view, much more important, not that they, it happens so often, but when it happens, it can have enormous outbreaks, up to 200, 300 people in the range, also in the Netherlands, that are reached by such events. And as the R depends on the transmissibility, so the shedding uh, uh, and the contact, the cohort, and infectious period, so all things that we really, a lot we do not know. So I think that over dispersion kappa seems to be more important than only the R. And the third thing I would like to share with you that we have learned is that we do not see reality because it is not the contact or the under one and a half meter, or it is the aerosol that is uh, only important in the transmission of the microorganism. It is the, um, the transfer of the carrier, which is Homo sapiens here. Uh, and here we see on the left side, an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 in the UMCG that reached about 80 people. And you see how the transfer of patients between wards, you see all the wards here, and the red ones are the ones with SARS-CoV-2 patients. You see how within a hospital, within about four weeks, transmission of transfer of, of patients occur. And uh, um, you cannot look so fast um, how fast the, um, uh, the patients are um, uh, transferred from one ward to the other. And would say, oh, that's something only happening in the UMCG. Now it is not in the right side. You see 
Another outbreak, uh, 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 but important here is not the microorganism, but the transfer of patients. And if you would click on it, and then uh, uh, you see how, how fast within the region the patients are transferred, and they even transferred over the border to the German hospital. And you see how fast these, these, these transfer can happen. And if you bring that together, transfer of patients in the healthcare system where 1.2 million people work, plus uh, all the patients are continuously admitted, you see how uh, riskful it is and how, how over dispersion can happen if they're in then not only contact, but also aerosol has an impact, then you see that it can spread very easily. And then I round up um, to give the word to Mariette. Um, um, asymptomatics are relevant, the over dispersion are relevant and healthcare network is a driver, but many things we do not know that are important to understand um, uh, the relevance of aerosol transmission in healthcare institutions. And so I hand over to Mariette. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, the coronavirus is a virus that we all known already for a long time. Actually, in the 60s, uh, the first time coronavirus uh, um, was detected. Um, in the hospital, uh, we see every year um, uh, many people with the different coronaviruses, what you see on top of, uh, of, of um, this picture. And what we do when patients um, uh, have one of these coronaviruses, we uh, take uh, droplet pre uh, precautions. And these droplet precautions we take are based on that um, we think that this virus is spread by droplets. And uh, we also take contact precautions because the droplets can, um, uh, can come on uh, in the environment uh, where you can pick it up. Um, the question what we have now, uh, what we uh, had last year was, uh, can it also be transmitted by aerosols? And this, this way of transmission, we uh, didn't take into account in the past, but um, yeah, we were thinking, is it necessary to take it into account with the new SARS-CoV-2 virus? And um, therefore we have the next research questions. Um, do aerosols of SARS-CoV-2 positive patients and healthcare workers contain viable uh, SARS-CoV-2 beyond, uh, beyond one meter and a half? Um, to answer this question, um, we first need, of course, an air sampler, and we looked up in the literature what kind of air sampler would be the best to use. And um, uh, for this study, we used the Coriolis uh, micro from the Berting uh, technology. Um, we used this one because it's cyclone-based air sampling, which means that the air inlet is, uh, is over here and the air goes, goes up, but there is um, uh, a cycling inside the cone. And therefore, the, uh, the damage to the microorganism um, should be less. And that's important for us because we also want to uh, culture the virus. Um, what we used was um, we used a cone and we did a five milliliter of uh, climb medium in the cone. And um, the flow rate of this machine we uh, put on 150 liters per minute for 10 minutes. Um, you can put it higher, but then we have uh, the disadvantage that uh, we need more fluid, uh, so more climb medium, and um, um, that would be less, um, yeah, then we have less chance to, to, to get uh, the, the, the cell cultures uh, right. So that was for us a reason to take um, 150 milliliters. Um, the methods we used as well, patients as, um, as uh, healthcare workers, first of all, the patients, um, patients who uh, were admitted to the UMCG, with SARS-CoV-2 could be um, uh, included in our study. Um, these were patients who had a uh, CT value, actually the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 CT value was less than 30. And we measured in the patient's room um, um, if we could find the aerosols back in the air. The patient's room in the, our hospitals have an air change per hour of three until four. And we also could um, measure on the intensive care units and there, um, the air change per hour is six. Um, uh, here you see the uh, test setup. Uh, we used two set test setups. First of all, uh, during October, December, we had a setup where it was a patient and we put the air sampler on uh, approximately one meter. And um, um, the distance between the patient and the air sampler was two meters. And later on, we um, changed our setup a little bit because then at that moment we um, um, used 
um, um, uh, a, a machine where we could, could put up our air sampler on one meter, one and a half, two meters, and two and a half meters. So we could go higher uh, actually. So still the distance between the patient and the machine was two meters, but we uh, we went up um, uh, yeah, more high actually. Um, uh, most of the patients got, of course, so, uh, some uh, respiratory support. Uh, this was often uh, um, high flow, uh, but sometimes also people only uh, had some oxygen. Um, for the healthcare workers, um, um, yeah, we used the healthcare workers who also tested positive in our hospital, um, which is, of course, a relatively healthy population compared to the patients. Um, what we did with these healthcare workers was we asked them to come to a separate location um, and it was a, a room from a three and a half by six uh, meters and this room didn't have any ventilation, only the natural ventilation. Uh, we had two rooms for them. Uh, one room we had a temperature of 23 degrees and a humidity of about 35 percent. And in the second room, we had a temperature of 15 degrees and humidity of 50%. And um, we asked the people to uh, come in. They were, uh, were, were wearing a mask at the moment that they ca uh, came in. They um, uh, were sitting down on a, on, on a chair and um, we asked to read the text. At that moment, they turned the, um, the mask off and uh, they started to uh, read a text, a Dutch text uh, for 10 minutes. And um, at that time, we were measuring um, uh, if we could find the um, aerosols, um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 back in the aerosols. The distance between the um, healthcare worker and the machine was 2 meters 20 at that moment. And the machine was on 1 meter 20 in the height. Um, when we took the samples afterwards, uh, we first did PCR. Um, uh, the RNA was extracted and uh, we put it into the machine where it was uh, amplified and then we got the result if a PCR was positive or negative. Um, a PCR below a CT value of 40, we um, um, uh, say it's positive and after 40, uh, uh, it was negative. Um, besides the PCR, we also looked already to this uh, cytopathic effect, um, which means we have a cell culture, we add our sample to it and we see if these cells are affected um, 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 by our sample, and um, this will take place only when um, when there is a virus inside the um, um, uh, the sample. Um, then we uh, briefly say something about the results. Um, um, first of all, the first measurement we did in October with the patients. Uh, we uh, did 15, uh, we took 50 patients, um, the age was around uh, uh, um, 86 years, um, mostly were male and a CT value of 23. Uh, we also see um, in January actually about the same 40 people we measured, the age was about the same, also more males than females, and the CT value was also about the same. Um, we took as well wards as uh, IC patients. Uh, we had less IC patients because most of the IC patients are um, intubated. So these are patients that we cannot measure, of course. And um, uh, we looked to the day, uh, day since the symptoms started, uh, which was uh, more uh, during October, December than it was in January. Compared to the healthcare workers, um, in the healthcare workers, we had 26 of, uh, six measurements. Um, the age was uh, 29, so they were really younger compared to, of course, the uh, patients. Um, in this case, there were more females. Uh, the CT value was a bit lower, and the day since the symptoms was also less um, because we immediately included the people, the healthcare workers, when they became positive. I quickly go further to the results, uh, looking to the time. In December, um, uh, we measured 15 uh, um, patients and uh, all 15 patients were negative. Uh, we didn't find SARS-CoV-2 back in the environment. So we discussed this result also with uh, the people from the University of Twente, and we thought maybe we are, are measuring on a too low level because we are measuring on one meter. Maybe we have to go um, to a higher level since the air is going up. So that's actually what we did in January, uh, as you could see in one of the, uh, of the other slides. 
And um, uh, we had 14 uh, patients. We did 55 measurements for these 14 patients. And we found uh, 13 uh, out of 55 PCR who are positive, that's uh, 4, 24%, and 6 out of 14 patients uh, where we found at least one positive result. The CT values were between uh, CT33 and CT37. Um, for the healthcare workers, um, as I said, we measured 26 persons. Uh, in total, because of the two rooms, we did 52 measurements. Uh, we found 14 PCRs uh, um, uh, positive, and it was of 10 different healthcare workers. Four, diff uh, four healthcare workers tested positive in both rooms. Um, yeah, as you can see, uh, could, can see in room uh, of 23 degrees, uh, there were five people tested positive. In a room of uh, 50 degrees, there were nine people. Um, because of the low number, this is not a significant uh, difference at the moment, but it's good to look further uh, into these results. Very preliminary results. The first uh, cell culture of the samples showed a cytopathic effect. Uh, we took a few samples uh, from CT33 and uh, CT34, and uh, we saw a, cy a cytopathic effect, which means that these cells um, uh, were um, um, influenced by, um, by our sample. Can I suggest that, we, uh, that you try to conclude here, and if there are yeah. other points, that it comes in the round table? Yes, I think this is the most important conclusion actually for the for the presentation, since um, um, uh, we looked into the results uh, because um, we changed from the height uh, one meter, one and a half, two and two and a half meters, um, and what we can see is that on all levels you see results, and then we look back to all the data, and what I think most of uh, important conclusion is that only within the first eight days, we see positive results and we don't see it after eight days anymore. So I think that's one of the most important conclusions. That's also what we see for healthcare workers. We didn't see any uh, significant uh, associations with, uh, with, for example, um, uh, clinical uh, symptoms. Um, so the conclusion is the SARS-CoV-2 was found in the air samples uh, taken beyond two meters uh, from a pers positive person. The positive samples could only be found in a person who had symptoms for less than uh, eight days. And um, 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 yeah, until now, we don't have a clear explanation why only a part of the person tested positive and some not. Uh, our data confirms that aerosol beyond uh, two meters can contain uh, SARS-CoV-2. And also in the literature, we already saw some studies who, um, uh, who saw the same. Oh. So did you follow up? I, I, with that that is actually I mean, thank you very much that I, I mean I, I realize you have a lot to tell but yes. uh, other people also do so uh, it's it's uh, thank you very much for the presentation we'll hopefully come back to this during the round table discussion and uh, I if you stop sharing your screen then I think we can go to the next the next speaker uh, and the uh, the next speaker uh, is uh, uh, is, uh, because I think we'll have to skip the question at this stage. The second, uh, the second speaker is uh, Howard Stone from Princeton University. Uh, Howard holds a PhD in chemical engineering from Caltech. Following a postdoctoral year at Cambridge, he was recruited by Harvard University School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where he quickly rose through the ranks. In July 2009, he moved to Princeton University, where he holds the chair uh, in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Howard's research interests of fluid dynamics, especially as they rise. Uh, it, it, in research and, and applications at the interface oh, engineering, okay. etc. Um, uh, Howard is already getting bored by my introduction, so he's going to talk about fluid dynamics and speech and COVID-19 transmission. Howard. Uh, thank you, Don, and uh, thank you for uh, to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to talk with you. I'm, I'm going to make a short presentation that is a uh, a collaboration with uh, quite a number of people, both in my group and in France and in, in India. And uh, the idea of the talk is I want to build on what you just heard and what you're going to hear, uh, which is the idea that uh, droplets and aerosols, which carry virus, may be uh, transmitted uh, through the air. I'm going to try to illustrate to you how these kind of ideas happen by using experiments and numerical simulations so you can visualize the idea. And I'm going to focus most on uh, those interactions that happen when you're close to one another, what I'll call direct transport. And um, to give you just the idea that they're uh, easily create droplets, I'm playing a movie which happens, uh, is taken over uh, tens of milliseconds when you open your lips to speak. 
Uh, the sounds you create, in, in particular in this movie, are the so-called plosives, which come from the pressurized air behind your lips, uh, drive air out, which also breaks up these little filaments. You'll be hearing a lot more about uh, droplets in uh, this talk, in uh, later talks, so I will let uh, the other experts tell you about that. But uh, I just want to make clear again, I want you to be able to visualize what's happening in the air around you when you speak, even though most of us uh, can't see that. Okay, so uh, it was just emphasized in the first two presentations that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spreading can happen. This was evident already in the news uh, within a month of the identification of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 disease. It was, uh, it's been written about a lot in the paper and you can find a large number of uh, events already back a year ago where it was clear that in many situations there was uh, super spreading like uh, uh, events taking place largely in gatherings where people were sharing air. So you're gonna hear about ventilation I think next and then throughout the presentations. I'm gonna tell you uh, more about what happens when you're close to one another in a casual engagement, engagement when you're talking. Now, why should this, uh, matter. You just heard uh, this nice previous talk that documents that uh, dr droplets and aerosols in the air can be carrying virus. So you should ask, what happens when you're talking to your friend uh, at a party or at dinner? And for example, we already know that if you uh, go into restaurants and, and have dinners or invite friends over for dinner, you're advised to reduce the number of people at the table and space them farther apart. One question you can ask is, is this still a safe thing to be doing uh, in the presence of an air, airborne transmitted disease? So one way I uh, will phrase this to you, and then you can decide for yourself what is uh, you need to do to reduce risk is, uh, suppose you get together with friends, you go to a party, you wear a mask, you're trying to be safe, you're together for an hour, and then you decide uh, to go for a walk, go have a coffee, an unmasked inner interact with a friend for five minutes. Does this have a significant effect on the likelihood that you might uh, get infected? Okay, so to just put the mask issue into context, uh, here are a whole set of movies we've taken with a, a CO2 imaging camera, where you can see on the top set of images, ordinary breathing, light breathing, heavy breathing, or, or hard blowing, and on the bottom, the same person with a mask on. And the most important thing to take away from these images is masks of course, reduce the uh, amount of droplets in the air. They play the role of a filter. You'll probably hear more about that. But from the, st the standpoint of where the air goes, the so-called transport problem, masks limit the distance the air can propagate out to only about 15 or so centimeters. And then normally the air then rises and then the ventilation uh, is what's most important in tr and transferring the air from around the room. So I'm gonna ask what happens when you don't have the mask. So we've studied this uh, in the lab. We've studied in the lab using uh, methods to image the airflow, which you see here. Uh, there's a speaker on the right in the screen and there's a, uh, a, a fog in the background so you can see what happens when the person speaks and the plosive sounds, which are in this case, the P-like sounds cause a big vortex to go across the room. You can uh, do this with other phrases. Uh, in this case here, a phrase with many plosives. You can visualize it with a high-speed camera and watch over the course of tens to hundreds of milliseconds that as you speak each sound, the plosive sounds carry vortical-like structures and the horizontal field of view that you're seeing is a meter and you will reach a meter easily within a few seconds of speaking. Down below is just an image processed uh, version of this so you can quantify all this data. What comes out of all this imaging, which are real experiments taken on real people as they speak, is that speaking tends to produce a conical airflow in front of you, what a fluid mechanician, engineer, or physicist would, would just call a, a, a fluid jet or a conical jet. And it's easily reaching a meter when you have uh, ordinary language that complete, contains these plosive sounds. We then decided to study this numerically. We uh, took advantage of the fact that pressure signals had been measured already in the 1960s and airflow uh, signals in speaking had been measured. We digitized them so we knew what the outflow was 
at the mouth as a function of time. We had the signature that was the equivalent of speaking. We then um, used numerical simulations. You'll hear about those also from other speakers. We made a model where we imagined the head was a little like a sphere. We had the mouth was an opening in the sphere. And then we solved what are uh, the equations that described air flows. And we asked, how would these air flows be transporting um, things in the air? And I'm just assuming that they're droplets in the air that remain in the air and they're, they're carried by the flow. And you'll hear a little bit more about that from other uh, speakers. Uh, so this is what a typical simulation of a speaking-like event is like. Uh, one of these signals I'm going to play is sing a song of sixpence, uh, uh, at least in English, and uh, another one would be Peter Piper picked a peck. And you see that in this case, over a time scale of about 40 seconds, you create a signal that goes out almost two meters, and it has the form of this conical-like jet. This is uh, generic. It it it. It happens just because of the way we speak. And it's just like other ha things that happen in the engineering and physics world where you, where you uh, create uh, air, uh, uh, flows of liquid shown at the bottom is an, an image of just an ordinary jet flow. It has all the features you have of, of when you speak, even though we don't see the flow created when we speak. Now, uh, because of this, you can ask yourself, um, what, what, what does happen when you're sitting in front of someone speaking? Now, outdoors is known to be much safer than indoors, but at short distances, you can imagine these jets propagating. And in uh, the physics and fluid mechanics world, we can quantify the speed of the jet, which you call V, um, the cross-sectional area created by the jet, um, the amount of airflow being created by the jet, which is the air that you produce plus the air that gets entrained. And finally, if there's a concentration of anything in your mouth, whether it's bad breath or uh, droplets carrying virus, we can keep track of how they change with distance here denoted X from the speaker. And because of that, we can then compare these quantitative estimates with actual numerical and experimental uh, situations. And here's a, a graph of the speed of the jet that we measure in the experiments versus distance. Uh, when you continually speak and repeat a sound, the, the distance increases. Uh, distance x is shown to the right. And the dotted line is this analytical result, which allows us to make uh, quantitative predictions. And then we can compare this with experiments. And so we ask, how far do things go? What distance L do things travel? You can uh, take that previous result and find that the distance traveled should grow like the square root of time. It should go increase with the speed uh, of the air at your mouth. Uh, A is the, the scale of the mouth and alpha is the cone angle. We tested this numerically and found that all of our results fall on the square root of T behavior for all of our numerical results, which is the idea of a continuous jet uh, if you just cough once, then uh, everything propagates as an individual puff, which is known to propagate, propagate uh, uh, slower. It grows as uh, time to a lower power. And we tested this idea in the lab by going out and measuring how far does your airflow propagate. That's L on the vertical axis versus time. All the data we collect um, falls close to the red curve, which is the square root of T shown at the top. And the point I just want to drive home is when you're mask free and speaking to people in environments that don't have much airflow, you easily get two meters. That's the CDC's guideline, which is twice the uh, World Health Organization's guideline. And you easily get it in 20 seconds of speech. And at two meters, you can expect to inhale 3% of the air uh, from someone two meters away from you. Um, okay. So uh, you might say that if you're talking to someone, there's interference of the two jets. So we've uh, studied uh, this with Sandeep Saha and his colleagues in India. And just shown on the bottom right is what happens if two people are speaking exactly one meter apart. They have slightly different heights because not everyone is the same height. And as soon as you have slightly different heights, the two jets produced by the speakers largely don't interfere. And within, in this case, 12 seconds of speaking, the jet from one person is engulfing the head of another person almost a meter away. Uh, and in that sense, um, we can show that. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, it, it means that not only do you have to think about distance, but you have to think about dose, which means you have to think about time. This was mentioned already by one or two of the previous speakers. And so you can 
uh, make a model of this kind of speaking flow and ask if you're listening to someone speak in, directly in front of you, like you see these two uh, heads in the uh, image on the right, um, what happens uh, when you breathe in? And so there's a little formula that lets you try to estimate the probability that you might get sick if you inhale a certain number, say N, of virus particles, so-called virions. And, and you measure that relative to a critical number that I think Daniel Bond might commented on that many people have uh, tried to estimate and is on the order of 100 for this virus. And so you can use the, uh, the uh, ideas I presented to you to say that um, people have measured how much virus there is in, a, in saliva. The previous speaker commented on that. Um, you know the airflow that comes from breathing, that's the symbol Q, and you know the contact time. And so this simple idea says it's not just social distance L, but it's also the contact time that you have with someone. And so you can make a, a space time diagram if you like. And obviously you want to put yourself at lower risk. So you want to be to the far right of this curve. You want to be far apart for only a short time. And um, you know we use some typical numbers here, but the most a crucial thing about these numbers, if you believe these pictures people are now showing you about airborne diseases, if you want to reduce your risk to say 10% of, of what someone might say it is, already at two meters, you only want to be in front of someone for a couple minutes. But the amount of virus can vary orders of magnitude, like factors of 100. You actually heard a little about that from the previous speaker. And uh, if you divide uh, a couple minutes by a uh, factor of 100, you get just a few seconds and you can all then decide what that means with respect to the comments you heard earlier about super spreading or hyper spreading. So I just wanna leave you with one last remark. Um, uh, people have been trying to share how we think about risk. And so recently there was a very nice uh, German news report talking about airborne transmission. And in it, two leading people, a leading scientist and a leading reporters who studied this, um, both wearing masks went into a restaurant and discussed how to stay safe indoors by staying further apart and by reducing the density in the, in the room. But then these two leading people who know about airborne transmission walked outside, took off their masks and stood less than a meter apart. They had slightly different heights and they were speaking face to face. And I think you have to ask yourself now in, in these kind of settings, what can you do as an individual to try to reduce risk? Um, and I would just suggest that this might not have been the safest way to go about illustrating the idea of staying safe in airborne transmission, although it was outdoors. So with that, I will uh, stop Dan and uh, answer any questions, but I've listed on this slide the kinds of things we've tried to study, um, both using uh, numerical simulations and experiments and trying to get you to think about both time and distance as a way to reduce your risk in the age of COVID. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Howard. Um, we have maybe a, a bit a time for a brief question. I'd, I don't see at the moment uh, questions in the Q&A session as, as far as I can tell. Um, so maybe then it is better to go, to, as we already are a bit behind schedule that we move on to the next talk and then see if there's more questions coming up by the time we get to the round table. The, the next speaker uh, is uh, Kath Noakes from Leeds School of Civil Engineering. Kath received her PhD in Fluid Dynamics from the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Leeds. Uh, she joined the Leeds School of Civil Engineering in uh, 2002 as a postdoctoral researcher uh, modeling air disinfection systems. In the years that followed, she quickly rose through the ranks and since 2014, she's been professor of environmental engineering uh, for buildings and, uh, at Leeds. Uh, Kath sits on the UK Scientific Advisory Group for Emergency, SAGE, which is advising government on its response to the pandemic. And in 2020, she received an OBE uh, for her work. Uh, when she received this, this honor from the Queen, she wrote, I want this award to demonstrate to young people and particularly one young women who are underrepresented in the profession that engineering is a deeply rewarding profession. Kath will speak about infection transmission in the built environment. Kath. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to jump straight in. Um, I'm going to start by taking a step back and saying, you know, the trying to think through the complexity of the mechanisms for how this disease might transmit. So I think we're going to hear an awful lot about droplets and aerosols today. Um, but this is it's a simplified diagram, but just to think through 
from a respiratory source what we might get and we get a whole range of different droplet sizes ranging from under a micron over to up to greater than uh, 100 microns and, and even bigger um, and in a simple way we can characterize these um, to show what where these might go and the different routes that we might end up with so the aerosols and smaller droplets might be inhaled um, some of those might be inspired and deposit in the in the, the nose, some of them, and then the larger droplets might actually end up being deposited on your eyes or nose or mouth. And equally, there is still the potential that we have droplets that deposit onto surfaces or even from hands directly onto surfaces, and then we can get transmission through contact with mucous membranes. Um, and we've, I've sort of to try and categorize these, although I, you know, I don't think you can absolutely split them up into separate transmission routes. We've kind of suggested that we have airborne transmission, which is via aerosols, via inhalation, nominally beyond about two meters, although as Howard has just shown, as it, you know, that's it's an arbitrary number that. Um, at close range, the transmission I think is the most complicated. It's through all the particle sizes. Um, and really, the, 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 that's a very uncertain route at, at, um, in terms of which particle sizes matter. And then via surfaces, I think that is um, the most uncertain route of all. It's very difficult to work out what happens there and indeed what the level of contribution is. Um, I think also it's important to think how do we know how transmission is happening and what types of evidence we can put into this. Um, so I think we, we already know that the relative routes of different transmission are unclear um, and probably will remain so for some time. But if we look at animal studies, we can see that studies with hamsters show that transmission can happen via the air and via fomites or surfaces um, within animal cages. Of course, it's very difficult to then work out from that what size droplets were involved and um, exactly how that transmission happened. I think some of the interesting data from those studies does show or start, start to suggest that although fomite transmission does happen, it's slightly less efficient than the transmission through the air. And there is a study out there in preprint which suggests that the, the via fomites, the hamsters have less severe disease. So there might be a relationship between mode of transmission and severity as well. Um, I think there is consistent evidence from outbreaks and contact tracing data that shows when people spend time in close proximity, um, there is quite a high um, risk of infection, um, albeit that some of these might be an artifact of how we're measuring things. So if you only contact trace people who are close together, then you only find that. Um, but I think there is sort of certain amount of the evidence that shows that when you are with somebody who's infected, the chances of you getting infected go up. Um, the evidence for fomite transmission in the um, in the environment is pretty hard to find. Um, there is some association from some of the studies that suggests that uh, better cleaning um, and better hand hygiene do reduce transmission. Um, what that really means is very difficult to say because whether it's an association with other hygiene factors, we don't know. Uh, we've already heard from the first speaker about super spreading um, and that can happen. It's as well as being associated with airborne transmission and indoor spaces. It's clear that there's an association with activities that relate lead to higher levels of exhalation. So um, high intensity aerobic activities, singing, uh, etc., all of which both are likely to produce more aerosols and also increase the breathing rate that you're likely to inhale them at. Um, if we start looking at where we've got data in the environment, it's actually quite patchy and it's not surprising. Um, it's very difficult if you were to go and take an air sample, you actually have to take an air sample at the time that somebody is exhaling that or very shortly afterwards, because if you leave it two hours, it'll have gone, it'll have been ventilated away, even in a fairly poorly ventilated space. Surface data, we can find that it will survive on surfaces that are not cleaned for quite long periods of time. Whether it survives as a live virus is uncertain but certainly there's evidence of RNA in some settings but it is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack going and sampling the environment and I think it's very difficult to say that sampling equals evidence of infection it is really just only one part of the jigsaw puzzle here. Um, we also know that where we do see airborne transmission there's quite a strong association with poorly ventilated spaces and again this might be biased as to 
the super spreading events which are, are easier to identify um, but there is you know quite a good indication that those those spaces where there is um, super spreading does tend to be where we've got very low ventilation rates so guidance for most ventilated buildings is typically around 10 litres per second per person and we're seeing these transmission in spaces which are you know an order of magnitude lower um, I think there is some interesting evidence of appearing from uh, the quarantine hotels in Australia and New Zealand which is now showing that there's a potential for room to room transmission too um, there is very little evidence for outdoor transmission so I think as Howard mentioned if you are close to somebody there is no reason why you couldn't inhale their breath but there's very little evidence that tra outdoor transmission happens in uh, more widely than that um, and I think we'll see today that there's plenty of insights we can get from modelling from physics and risk models um, I think one of the challenges here is getting that evidence accepted by uh, um, an epidemiological community um, I think the other thing we, to flag here is that transmission can happen anywhere. Um, it's very easy to get hung up on this setting is more or less risky than another one. It happens anywhere where people come together. There are certain risk factors that make things more or less risky. If it's poorly ventilated, if people are likely to be louder, have higher exhalations and not wearing masks, then we, we start adding up the risk factors in there and duration and proximity as well in there. I think it's also important to flag that it's not always what it seems. So it's very easy to see a suggestion that an outbreak has been associated with a workplace and immediately think that that happened in that workplace. When you start investigating some of the outbreaks, you start finding that actually quite a lot of that transmission happened in surrounding settings. So it might have happened in a shared vehicle, might have happened in a, where because people shared a house together, a social setting linked to that workplace. It's not necessarily within for example the office um, i'm not really going to talk very much about close range other than to say that this is incredibly complex and i think we need to think not just about the sizes of, of aerosols and droplets that are transmitted through the air and how they are maintained in the air but also the ones which cause infection and if we were talking about tuberculosis we only care about those smallest ones, the respirable aerosols, simply because in order to cause infection, that uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria has got to get to the deep lung. For SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't. So there are receptors all the way through the respiratory system, from the nose and the mouth, all the way through into the lungs. And therefore it's quite possible that particles of all sizes matter for this disease, uh, which I think is what's one of the things that causes so much complexity in understanding the transmission. I'm going to talk more about the airborne transmission, so I'm not going to think about what's happening when you're very close to somebody. I think more about what happens when you are let's say nominally further than two meters away um, at a simplest level we can treat a room as a, a well mixed space now there are obviously caveats to that many spaces are not well mixed and it will depend on the air distribution pattern in there but as a first order we can look at this as an exploration we can um, uh, the, the image just shows some of the many different factors that we could put into a mass balance model um, to explore the, the likely exposure from inhalation of, of aerosols and droplets. Um, I think when we start thinking about ventilation and sizes of spaces, um, it starts to get quite complex. It's, there's not a single parameter that is uh, characteristic of a space. Some people argue that you must have a particular air change rate or you must have a particular flow rate in litres per second per person. Um, the two graphs are, are just a really simple demonstration that it isn't as straightforward as that. So on the left, you've got a, an office scenario where uh, 10 litres per second per person, let's say that's our ideal. Um, if we halve the ventilation rate, we obviously double the, the concentration that you would inhale. Um, and if we take it down to a tenth of that, then you see that over time, it takes a long time, it hasn't even reached a steady state yet. Um, so if you were only in that space for a very short period of time, your exposure would be quite small, it probably wouldn't matter what the ventilation rate is so much, but it matters over a long period of time. You look at the larger space, actually the air change rate is massively smaller in there. Um, there are a lot more people in there, but it's a huge space. And therefore, if we can make the assumption of a fully mixed space, 
then that large space acts to dilute that, that pathogen quite considerably. So we need to actually think about relationships between the flow rate, the number of people, the size of the space, rather than fixating on a single parameter to describe ventilation. And we took some of this information and we, we used a, a simple, um, assumed a well-mixed model, um, but looked at uh, exhalation of different sizes of particles and compared some different scenarios, um, looking at duration of exposure, ventilation rate, the size of the space, and the emission of aerosols that associated with different vocalizations um, from some of the published data, and to look at what the relative risks might be in some different settings. And we've done this re relative to a reference space, which is the first one on the left, which is a, a classroom type space. We looked at then what would be the difference if you change the ventilation of that classroom, which are the next four um, cases, which change the ventilation rate from a, a ventilation with a, a, a 750 parts per million CO2 in the room to up to 5,000 as the highest one. Um, offices are quite similar and most of the similar classrooms and offices are similar simply because people are there for a long period of time during the day. But we then, I mean, the very lowest one actually comes down as a supermarket. And the reason for this is actually, it's a short duration of time. It's a very large space that we have assumed with a reasonable ventilation rate and people are wearing masks. And you add all these things together, you start to get the risks become quite low of inhalation. Whereas on the far right, the second from the second to last one is the Skagit choir outbreak. And you can see the risk there is far higher because it's a poorly ventilated space and because the exhalations are higher. That's just exposure. If we want to think about how we link this to risk of infection, we need to think, consider what that means in terms of the viral dose that uh, people are exposed to. There are two ways in which people tend to do this. We can use something called the Wells-Riley model, where, which relates um, the number of infections you might find in a space to the ventilation rate, the occupant breathing rate, and the infectious doses that are generated over a particular period of time. Um, and this is, this is valid for when we can assume it is in the air. We can also do something similar, which we could take the um, exposure that you could calculate and then use a dose response model um, to calculate the risk of infection. One of the challenges we have with SARS-CoV-2 is we don't have a dose response model for it yet. Um, I'm showing two here for other coronaviruses and you can see there's potentially an order of magnitude or more difference in those dose response models. Um, so they're actually quite hard to, to get hold of these. So I'm gonna show you some results which use a Wells-Riley approach um, and we're going to mention quanta. So quanta is this, it is this, this uh, tends to get back calculated from a, an outbreak. Uh, these are for some different diseases. And I think the important thing I want to flag here is the, the variability. In particular for the MDR-TB or TB outbreaks in the first place um, and the influenza ones, you can see that that emission rate varies over several orders of magnitude just between different people in those settings. So I think we need to bear in mind we're seeing the same thing for this disease. Um, there is some early data which attempted to calculate quanta um, and you can see that we get the same thing happening that the, the potential generation rate might vary over four orders of magnitude depending on the activity that somebody's doing in a space and their, their um, the, their breathing rate and their exhalations. Um, and the super spreading type outbreaks, um, and we, we calculated it for a Skagit choir outbreak, are significantly higher than you might expect in a, a, a resting scenario, which might only be something like one quanta per hour. Um, and just to show what this might mean in terms of the relationships between ventilation rate and time, um, you can see that if you've heard on the left for one quanta per hour, um, if you predict using a Wells-Riley model, a percentage of people infected um, under a, a steady state condition, you can get quite high um, percentage infected, but only when the ventilation rates are very low. Under, um, it, under transient conditions, actually, it's almost it's, it's a very low risk all the time. But once you go to, say, 100 quanta per hour, actually, you could have an incredibly variable range of risk depending on how long you're in a space, 
and whether it the, the ventilation whether you're under steady state or transient conditions um, in that scenario um, and what the ventilation rate is so quite a big range and it these this variation between uh, the parameters that, that are going to control this means it's actually quite difficult to really understand what the risks are in different settings. The last um, air model I would like to show you is, is one where we very briefly two minutes a minute oh don't want me to finish up <laughs> okay so we've looked at um, um, whether you could use carbon dioxide as a proxy um, and use this to look at schools and what we can see in here is that we have uh, considerably considerable variation in risk with season simply because the ventilation rate changes through season and I will skip the next two and just say um, that I think we're, we, we are starting to learn what happens but we have a lot of gaps in our knowledge we still don't understand how much the variation in viral load matters in terms of how many what the size of aerosols that contain the virus what are the emission rates in different settings we don't have dose response information yet um, and then really to understand the mitigation measures we need all of this this data to be able to work this out and i will stop there as i know i'm over time thank you very much i mean actually uh, i'm pretty sure that some of these points will come back in the roundtable discussion so i think that uh, you'll have a second to go at it later but right now I, i'd like to thank you and uh, we go to the next speaker, uh, and that is Daniel Bond for the Institute of Physics at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Daniel is there already. Yeah, he did his PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Amsterdam. After his PhD, he worked at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, where he's at present directeur de recherche. Uh, in 2003, he moved part-time to the University of Amsterdam, where he now has concentrated most of his research on the flow and phase behavior of complex fluids. And Daniel will speak about small aerosol droplets and possible transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Daniel. Yes. Can you see my screen? Dan? Yes, yes we yes, see it. Fine. Yes, all fine. Yes. Very good. So I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit on uh, what the aerosols are and how they behave. So small droplet aerosols from coughing and speaking and uh, the potential uh, of SARS-CoV-2 transmission by these small uh, aerosols. And so if you want to understand what an aerosol is, uh, you only have to imagine uh, how long cigarette smoke, which is an aerosol uh, you can still smell after somebody has passed with a cigarette. That, that is how long it lingers in the air. And this uh, little demonstration shows uh, how far they actually travel, several meters. Uh, and so they clearly define the one and a half meter or the one meter or the two meter or the six, six foot rule. Um, and so we should be worried about them. Um, and so we uh, investigated uh, the uh, generation and persistence of aerosols. And this is my colleague uh, Antoine, uh, who is wearing a respiratory mask that was not used during the first uh, outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 uh, because it generated a lot of aerosols and people were worried. And you see that he, he breathes through a laser sheet that allows us to visualize these aerosols. And so if I do the same thing for a uh, cough, uh, and I digitalize the, the image, so this is a real uh, experiment, you see that there's lots of large droplets. I will play it, uh, play it again. Uh, but you can also see, if you look carefully, that there's lots of small specks still uh, staying around uh, uh, when these large droplets has, have already fallen to the ground uh, for a long time. And so these are the, uh, these are the aerosols. Um, and so we went about uh, asking ourselves, what is the size of these aerosols? And so we looked at uh, what happens when people cough, and then we get, uh, uh, if we do laser diff diffraction of the droplet sizes, we get small droplets between roughly 1 and 10 microns, uh, but we also get loads of uh, large droplets that you've just seen between 100 and 1,000 micrometers. 
Um, large drops uh, are the ones that fall to the ground very rapidly. This is beautifully shown uh, by our colleague uh, Lydia Boribia uh, in this image where you see uh, a color coded uh, cuff where the large droplets fall onto the ground within one and a half meters, but these red small droplets, which are the aerosols actually uh, persist and uh, do not fall onto the ground. And so if we speak, uh, we actually found uh, that uh, we have the exact same aerosol drop distribution uh, as uh, we have uh, for coughing. And so these are uh, just after uh, the coughing or speaking, the usual definition of aerosols is, is particles smaller than five micrometers, but don't worry because these drops will evaporate and probably lose uh, about half of their uh, uh, diameter. Okay, then uh, the question is, of course, uh, how uh, many of these do you generate? And so what we uh, did is we weighed uh, the uh, amount of liquid ex expelled from a cough, which is about uh, uh, 0.07 grams. Um, and uh, speaking 10 times the famous stay healthy, uh, uh, is uh, gives uh, some somewhat less uh, volume, uh, and we since we know the volumetic distribution, uh, we know how many of these drops are generated. And so the first important uh, uh, conclusion is since these large droplets are a thousand a hundred times larger in diameter, they are a million times larger in volume, and so most of the liquid actually is in these large droplets, and so. Uh, if somebody is infected, uh, most of the virus particles from the saliva are actually also in these large droplets. Nonetheless, because these aerosols are so small, you generate a lot of them. Um, and so we, uh, uh, we find that for a single cuff, you, uh, you produce a stunning 20 million of these uh, aerosol droplets and about 7 million for speech. Now, and the worrisome thing is, um, as with the cigarette smoke, that these persist for a very, very, very long time. So this is uh, aerosols uh, in an ill-ventilated room. We generate aerosols, uh, as I will explain in a minute, uh, at, at t equals zero. And then we see that even after 16 minutes, uh, the amount has decreased a little bit, but there's still loads and loads of these small droplets uh, around. And this is how we generate the aerosols. We actually have a very special nozzle that makes very small droplets. And this is again visualized with the laser sheet. And so this allows us to generate a known amount of aerosol droplets and then look at how their number, sorry, decreases as a function of time. And so if we have a small ill ventilated room, think of a, a bathroom, for instance, uh, you can see that the time it takes for the aerosols to decrease by 50% uh, is about five minutes. And that, of course, means that if somebody comes after you into the same bathroom, that he's still, he's still in uh, your aerosols if you have coughed. If you open a window, which we call poor ventilation, uh, this time immediately decreases very significantly to about one and a half minute. And if you open a door and a window, which is what we call good ventilation here, uh, you get to something like 30 seconds. Yeah? And so ventilation is incredibly important to get rid of these aerosols. Now, can we be more quantitative? I won't bother you with the physics details, uh, but of course, uh, the way that these uh, droplets go away is that they sediment under the uh, action of gravity. You have to uh, calculate that to take into, into account the fact that the, they evaporate and that they have some initial velocity. And so if you just put all that together and you compare that to our persistence measurements, so this is the number of drops as a function of time, you actually find that without adjustable parameters, uh, because we also know the drop sizes, of course, from our uh, measurements, uh, that we get a very good description of the persistence of these aerosols, not only of our data. Uh, there was a lovely study by the group of Adbax in PNAS in, in 2020, uh, and they had similar data, and our model actually fits those data or describes those data, I should say, very well. 
Then you can, uh, if you understand that, uh, also investigate the effect of ventilation. Um, here to the right, you see a, a curve where uh, it, it still takes a very long time. This is a, clearly an ill-ventilated room, but uh, if you then turn on uh, the ventilation and you have a number of air changes per hour, which is the usual unit of about four, um, you get a, a, a different result where, uh, again, a simple model taking all these uh, effects into account quantitatively relates the persistence to the ventilation rate. Okay, what you really, of course, want to do is to uh, try and estimate a risk. And the previous speakers have already mentioned this. Uh, we don't know much yet about uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, but the uh, general uh, uh, agreement is that you need to have been in contact with around 100 of these virus particles before you run a considerable risk of being infected. Well, if you uh, know that a, a normal person uh, uh, breathes something like eight liters per minute, and you know how many of these aerosol particles uh, are uh, in the air, you can actually see whether you reach uh, these uh, numbers or not. And so this is for a, a normal person where you can barely see these uh, aerosols. Um, and so if you think that if you, you take from the literature that there's about uh, seven million virus particles per milliliter of saliva and you do the calculation because we know how many and of what size particles we have, we find that there's about 10 to the fourth virus particles in the aerosols after one cuff. And then you can do the calculation. Somebody coughs in a room and I enter that room uh, X minutes, that is the Y axis, after that person has coughed and I stay there uh, again for another uh, number of minutes. And so if it's a normal person, uh, the risk is not very large. There are, however, two buts that you've already heard. Uh, there are people who actually produce much more uh, in our experiments, about 20 times more uh, fluid when they cough than other people. So, than other people. so these people uh, are, are suspected super spreaders. Uh, and so if you do the uh, calculation uh, for the same room, etc., where you walk in, uh, you after a couple of minutes after the person has coughed, and you stay for another couple of minutes, you see that there's already a, a risk if you stay too long in a room. That's what Kath just uh, told you too. Even worse, uh, we've seen that at uh, the early times of the infection, the viral load can be much larger. Um, and so uh, Wolfel et al. say that uh, the maximum viral load is something like 2 billion virus particles per milliliter. And so if you redo the calculation, then if there's a super spreader uh, who has this viral load, uh, basically everybody gets infected all the time. And if it's not the case, uh, if it's not a super spreader, you still run a risk if you are around that person for too long. Okay, um, can we do something useful with that? Um, this is uh, this goes back to the to the first talk. Uh, are uh, hospitals really very dangerous a source of uh, transmission? This is uh, uh, an experiment we did in a, an outpatient cardiology clinic where somebody is on a, a training bike to do a cardiac stress test. And we uh, now use a, a, a handheld clean room particle counter to count the number of aerosols. That's much uh, easier than uh, the laser sheet. And, and we've validated the method. And what you see is even though the person doesn't even speak or cough, uh, the blue curve is the amount of aerosols produced by the person cycling on this bike. Um, and so this is uh, the air change rate in the clinic is about uh, uh, 14, uh, which means that the air is changed roughly every four minutes, which is in line with our uh, half lifetime of the aerosols of about two minutes. Yeah, and so this is such a good ventilation that actually the levels never get so high that this person on the bike will infect either the medical staff or patients coming after him. Another interesting remark that also goes back to cath talk is I can measure the CO2 
simultaneously. Um, and the CO2 measurement is, of course, much more easy than the uh, than the uh, uh, aerosol measurement uh, that actually correlates very well. And so that should be an easy method to really uh, do uh, an assessment of whether uh, a space is safe or not. Yeah, and so I conclude, uh, I think we've developed some simple tools to quantify the generation of aerosols uh, and their persistence. Uh, we can use simple physics engineering models uh, to actually understand the relation between the persistence time and the effect of uh, ventilation. And so this can in principle be used to do risk assessment, which is I think what we really want and need to do. And so I should uh, thank all my co-authors uh, saying of course that everything stupid I might have say said about virology uh, and viruses and epidemiology uh, is not their responsibility, but entirely mine. Uh, I should thank Stefan, Scott, Case, Reinoud, Arnoud, and Leo. And so if you want to read more about this, uh, our last paper on this came out actually today. Thank you very much. And I give the word back to Dan. Oh, thank you very much, Daniel. I should add that as the, the talk is streamed on YouTube and the YouTube stream will remain, people who cannot quickly write this down, they should be able to find it back on the YouTube stream. Okay, good. Um, I, I think that although Daniel timed it perfectly, there is actually not really additional time for a question right now. So I think Daniel and I, I suggest that we go on to the next speaker. Uh, and that is Sander Herfst of the Medical Center of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And Sander there leads the Respiratory Virus Transmission Group uh, at the D Department of Virus Science of the Erasmus Medical Center. He obtained his PhD in 2008 uh, at the Erasmus Center on vaccination strategies to combat human uh, metapneumovirus uh, uh, infections. And since then, his research has focused on pathogenesis, virulence, and transmissibility of respiratory viruses with emphasis on influenza viruses. And his group now focuses on the stability of respiratory viruses in the air and of virus shedding in patients, viral load in the air, and other factors that, uh, other factors that affect transmissibility. And today, Sandra will speak about airborne transmission of COVID-19 virus. And I think that you, uh, you show your, your own view of the, of the, the slides. Not the, this is the one where we see the next slide, slide too. So um, maybe you temporarily have to go out of the screen share mode and, uh, and start it and, um, can you go to the top? Yeah, okay, this is much better, yes. And now you can go. But now it's not full screen, eh? Uh, it, no, you have to still go full screen. No, oh, ah. Um, I, I would suggest that in, okay. Yeah, hide presenter view, can you do that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, wait a second. Um, yeah, I apologize for this. It, wor it worked uh, before. And this is Murphy's Law, don't worry. That's all. Yeah, good. I will just try it again. <laughs> uh, I can't start my uh, video, by the way. I'm uh, That is blocked. No. For whatever reason, by the, by the host. Uh, now I can start it. Yes. Now full screen. Um. I, I would I would suggest you just go ahead. I mean, uh, there are no no terrible secrets in your your next slide. So why don't you just tell the story on the basis of what you have here? Um, yes. Maybe you can blow up the slide and shrink the next slide. That's the only thing you might want to do. Yeah. Sorry. This uh, I now can't see my own screen. Oh, that. Maybe we can um, go to the next speaker first, and I can go after that because. Sure. Some uh, issues here. I will, go, I will go after and I will come back. Uh, okay, so the uh, oh, the next speaker, I, I hope that the next speaker is ready. Uh, it's Detlef Loze from the Physics of Fluid Group at the University of Twente. Detlef, are you ready? Okay. Detlef did his PhD at the University of Marburg. He was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Chicago. And shortly after that, he was appointed chair of Physics of Fluid at the University of Twente. He is also director of a Max Planck Institute for Dynamics of Self-Organization, but not uh, in Göttingen. Exceptionally, he's Max Planck director for the director of Physics of Fluid Group in Twente. And Detlef will speak about extended lifetime of respiratory droplets. Uh, Detlef, thank you. Oh. 
good. Do yes. you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So this is um, joint work with Stephen Shong, Shong Shen Hung, Naoki Hawari, Morgan Lee, uh, Ray Yang, and Roberto Vazico, whom you all see below here. So um, how to stop a pandemic? Uh, there were empirical rules in 1919. Uh, so 1919, they knew there is danger in the air in which they cough and sneeze. And this is, in fact, the title of our seminar today. Suspects should wear the masks and open the windows at home and at office. Uh, and the question I would like to address today in this talk is, um, where is danger in the air? How long is there danger in the air? And under what conditions? Uh, so where has been answered by or, or in fact suggested by Wells in 1934. So he developed this picture of the isolated droplets. And um, the, the, uh, he assumed that these large droplets would fly ballistically. And this would imply uh, that within six feet, there would be some danger. Uh, but beyond that, there wouldn't be any danger because these uh, drops would evaporate. So uh, these uh, affect the, this is based on the so-called D2 law that the uh, square of the diameter goes down linearly with time. And this implies that droplets uh, with a diameter of 100 micron have a lifetime of two seconds and droplets with 20 microns diameter have a lifetime of 0.2 seconds. So this gives this classical Wells evaporation falling curve, which you see here. So at the top, you see the droplet diameter in millimeter. And uh, this direction here is the time. And you see here the trajectories of these droplets. And uh, those big droplets fall to the ground, uh, whereas the small droplets uh, evaporate. So this was the picture. And this implies the six feet rules, which is still applied today. However, is this right? Uh, so um, here, uh, the question is, um, is this appropriate? Uh, and uh, we will look into this, uh, and we will look into this by means of numerical simulation. I won't go into the model. Um, we will study the effect of the turbulent puff, uh, and we'll study in particular the effect of the relative humidity and of temperature and the effect of ventilation. So what you see here is, in fact, um, respiratory event like speaking or coughing. Um, and uh, it's quite some information. Um, so here is a mouse on the left. Uh, and what you see as background color is the relative humidity. And you see that the relative humidity of what you speak, the vapor puff is in fact pretty high. It's nearly 100%. What you also see here are the droplets. They are in color. Uh, and the color in fact signals the size of the droplets. And you see, that these small droplets, they all stay in the air. Uh, they are trapped in the vortices, whereas the bigger droplets fall down uh, to the ground. Uh, and uh, the reason that these droplets stay in, in the air for so long is first, that they are very small, but second, they are protected by this water puff, uh, water vapor puff, which is around them. So this is what you see here. Uh, so. Here, uh, the background relative humidity is 50%, but the relative humidity uh, of this puff is much, much higher, up to 100%. And it is this vapor puff which protects the droplets from evaporation and, in fact, uh, implies this very large lifetime. So here, I show you different droplets, droplets of 10 micron, 100 micron, and 1,000 micron in different colors. And you see that the big droplets indeed fall to the ground, uh, but the small droplets, the 10 micron droplets, they simply stay in these vortices. They are trapped, and in fact, they are protected from evaporation. Um, and um, the relevant parameter which determines the uh, evaporation, in fact, is not the ambient relative humidity, but the local relative humidity, which is much, much higher. Uh, and this delays the evaporation as compared to wells. So when we now compare uh, those results uh, with the, for the lifetime of the drops with the results of wells, you see that the small droplets here have a lifetime which is 40 times larger 
as compared to the lifetime suggested by wells. When we go to ambient relative humidity of 90%, in fact, they are even up to 150 times uh, longer in, 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 in their life, implying that they fly much, much further. So here uh, I compare the lifetime of the drop as compared with the lifetime suggested by wells. And you see here for the small droplets, it's up to a vector 200 uh, larger for high relative humidity. Uh, so uh, the uh, path of uh, high vapor concentration protects those droplets from evaporation. Uh, it is, is what we see again in these two cases here. In particular, this holds for very high relative humidity. So how do the absolute evaporation times compare to the Wells classical evaporation falling curve prediction? This is what you see here. I showed this picture before. Now I turn it around. Uh, by 90 degrees. So here you see the trajectories. So those droplets here fall to the ground. And according to Wells' picture down here, the small droplets, they shouldn't exist after some time. But when we now compare this with our simulations, you see plenty of droplets here. So in Kala, we have the count, and there's a huge count for these small droplets uh, at, uh, uh, at long times still. Uh, and these droplets here should all not exist according to this Wells picture. So we clearly must conclude uh, that this Wells picture is not valid. And with this success of cuffs, cuffs or respiratory events, these droplets travel even longer distances. So the fixed six feet rule clearly is not sufficient. Uh, and my strong advice is to respect this physics law uh, of aerosol spreading. And if you uh, follow the news today, so perhaps today is a particular uh, topical command uh, to stress this. So these uh, laws of nature uh, cannot be banned. So what is the role of the ambient temperature? So up to now, I showed you events at relatively high ambient temperature. So here it's at 30 degrees, but now we go down to low ambient temperature, in this case to 10 degrees, and you see that this effect of extended lifetime is even more pronounced. Uh, so uh, at a high uh, relative humidity and low temperature, clearly infections could also occur outside. So here I compare those two cases, 30 degrees and 10 degrees. And you see already from looking at these pictures, there's a huge difference in the coherence of this path. And this implies a huge difference on the uh, effect of the uh, uh, development of the droplet size. So for 30 degrees, the droplets uh, still shrink, uh, slowly so they shrink, but at 10 degrees outside, uh, in fact, the droplets even grow initially. And the reason for this is that at, uh, in the beginning, uh, when you breathe warm uh, uh, vapor, uh, into the cold air, uh, which can uh, catch, uh, uh, which can contain much, much less vapor than uh, warm air, then this warm air which you breathe out uh, has no uh, choice but to let the vapor condense at this droplet. And therefore, the droplets even grow. I mean, this is well known effect. Uh, in, in fact, uh, from um, uh, from, from when you go skiing in winter. I mean, here you see, uh, in fact, the relative uh, humidity, the local relative humidity at 30 degrees and at 10 degrees. And you see that the local relative humidity at 10 degrees around these droplets is higher as oversaturation because of these very cold temperatures. Uh, and therefore, these droplets grow. And warm air can contain more moisture than cold air. And for the cold scales, for the cold cases, that means that there's nucleation and growth of these droplets. And you have all seen pictures of this type, uh, where you have this uh, what people call white smoke. Uh, this is simply uh, droplets uh, which uh, uh, nucleate and which grow. So, in conclusion, uh, we see there's this paradigmatic change. There's a paradigmatic change from this picture from Wells uh, to. Um, modern picture of multi-phase turbulent cloud emission, uh, which uh, Lydia Borubia developed over the last years, and which clearly uh, shows that the six-feet six rule 
is no longer uh, sufficient. Uh, however, there are also, um, well, here, here I, I answer this question, there's danger in the air, where uh, and how long and under what conditions. So six feet rule clearly is not sufficient. And the lifetime of these small droplets is up to, up to 200 times larger. And this is most serious uh, for large relative humidity and for small uh, temperature. And I have worked out the physics and the principles there. Uh, and well, here you see uh, the publication uh, when you can want to read details. Uh, but there are also open questions. So how many viruses are in a drop of a certain size? Uh, are droplets nuclei, so these dried out droplets, are they infectious? And if so, how long? And what is the effect of the salt on the operational rate? And what is the effect of proteins and surfactants in the, on the evaporation rate? All this is contained in saliva. And here you see SEM images taken in our group by Corolla, Seifert, and uh, Avaromarin. This is uh, a pure a uh, droplet with sodium chloride, and here you have sodium chloride and mucine, and sodium chloride and mucine and surfactants. You see that the uh, droplet nucleus, the dried out droplet, is pretty different in all three cases, which clearly has an effect which is not understood at all and must be further explored. Uh, further issues on ventilation, and I would briefly like to address uh, ventilation here. So, how can ventilation help to reduce aerosols, and what is sufficient and efficient ventilation? for contaminant removal. So here you see different ventilation concepts uh, out of a paper by Paul Linden. So here you have an opening at the bottom and a opening at the top. This is called displacement ventilation. Uh, and uh, it's in fact particularly uh, efficient uh, as you will see. So it's heavily used in offices and uh, in hospitals. So the opening is uh, at the bottom where air is pumped in and uh, the exit is at the top. So all this is done with displacement ventilation and it's very beneficial. So why is displacement ventilation beneficial? So here's someone sitting in, a ro in the room with a thermal plume going upwards and this uh, fills the room with heat. Uh, and when you now blow in fresh air here and let fresh air go out there, uh, this contaminant and the warmer air it's discharged upwards and you get, in the end, you get a stable situation of this type, provided this rate is large enough. And what happens is that the CO2, which you exhale, or uh, aerosol droplets, they uh, accumulate in between uh, this layer up here and this layer up here. You want this to be high enough and therefore the air exchange rate must be high enough. So let's check whether this picture indeed is true. And uh, we set up a numerical simulation here with realistic conditions and measure velocity, temperature, vapor, and CO2 concentration. And the main control parameter is the air, air change rate per hour. It's called ACH and it had also been mentioned in other talks. And one ACH corresponds to 10 liter per second per person. Uh, and here you see a simulation. The color is now the temperature. And this is weak inflow uh, ACH uh, of one. And you see it's not sufficient. Uh, also, when we look into the uh, contamination, um, here is the CO2 concentration, which is the proxy, so to say, for the aerosol, and uh, uh, really gets trapped uh, as predicted by the theory. So here you see the CO2 concentration. And right here at the height of 1.5 meter, it's trapped. And you really don't want to breathe there, in particular when this is not CO2, but when these are aerosols. This is this lock up effect, which I mentioned, and we confirm this in this direct numerical simulation. When we now go to higher ventilation rate, ACH of five, then this problem is gone. So you see that this layer is shift upwards uh, and uh, that the trapping no longer occurs. Here. So here you see influx outflow. So this works very well. It shows uh, the, uh, how important the ventilation is and how important efficient ventilation is. So this displacement ventilation. So here is the curve of the CO2 concentration, which, uh, which first here is very high. That's why high buildings are also very adventurous. Uh, and uh, it's also much lower as compared to the other case. Uh, so here I show you the height of this zone as a function of the air exchange rate. And well, it increases here as you would expect, 
Uh, and in fact, you can also describe this with some scaling law, which I show here. Uh, it also holds when there are two people in the, uh, uh, in the room. This is note that this is per person. Uh, however, at some point it separates. So at some point, uh, more does not help more. You would like to understand why this is the case. And indeed we do understand this. In fact, this levels off. There are two types of uh, flow uh, patterns, either buoyancy dominated or inflow dominated. And this is why there is, is this transition to the separation. So really want to be uh, around here uh, and uh, in, in this uh, regime where it's inflow dominated and not buoyancy dominated here. I, I think you have an option. you'll, you'll have to, okay. Yes, so here I have the conclusion. So um, there are open questions is how can protecting plexiglass wall improve the situation? How to make use of air filters in the best way? Uh, and um, up to now, people have only looked into energy efficiency, uh, but um, well, I mean, you should look into aerosol discharge and the way to go would be heat exchangers. And with this, okay. I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Zetlef. Um... So uh, in view of the time, we will postpone the questions. And I'm sure there are many also in this context for the round table. Uh, Sander, how are you doing? What happened to Sander Harst? There, there. You think that your presentation is going to work? I don't hear you. Sander? You're mute. Ah. You're still mute. You, uh, sorry, Sander, you're on mute. Yes. Yes, I know. I'm, I'm really struggling now with my uh, with everything. <laughs> sorry, I mean, but if it doesn't work, uh, there's a backup. Your backup presentation is, oh, it works. You see it now? Yes, it's fine. fine. Go ahead, take it is from it here. Is it full screen now? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Um, my apologies for the mess. Uh, it didn't work out too well. Uh, anyways, um, sorry, um, Dan, thank you for the introduction that you already did before uh, the previous speaker, actually. Um, so in general, respiratory viruses can uh, spread via different routes. It was already mentioned, of course, also by the previous speakers. Um, so from a donor to a recipient, uh, viruses can be transmitted via direct contact, for example, via handshaking. Uh, it can be via indirect, uh, indirect contact, for example, via surfaces, a table or a doorknob, uh, but it can also be uh, transmitted via the air, uh, either via aerosols or via droplets. Um, and there are many different uh, respiratory viruses and the relative contribution of these different routes uh, to the spread of the viruses in the human population is, uh, is largely unknown. Uh, for example, for some viruses, the direct contact transmission is the most important route of uh, transmission, but it doesn't mean that transmission via the air doesn't occur at all. Uh, so to better understand the transmission routes of the virus between humans, um, we need quantitative data on the factors that affect this transmissibility. Uh, and for that, we can divide the transmission cycle in three phases. Um, so on the donor side, we, uh, we need to know what the viral load is. So that is the amount of infectious virus that is shed by an individual. Uh, furthermore, we need information on the duration of virus shedding. Uh, which can be a day or it can be a couple of days. Um, for, and for example, for influenza viruses, we know that, that uh, viruses can be shed as, as single particles, but also as big viral aggregates. Uh, and, and well, it anticipated that single virus particles can be easier transmitted to uh, other individuals. Uh, and furthermore, sneezing, coughing, talking, and singing, we've seen beautiful movies of that already uh, that may affect the amount of virus that is shed uh, and, but then in turn, that in turn may also depend on the anatomical site of the respiratory tract uh, where the virus is actually replicated. Um, then when the viruses are expelled uh, by a donor, uh, we need, first of all, to, we need to know if there's actually virus present in these aerosols and droplets. Uh, and if so, if these viruses are viable or stable. And with that, I mean, if the viruses are still infectious and are able to uh, infect a, a new host. Uh, the fate of the virus, of course, then depends on the size of the particles in which it is contained, but also the speed of the evaporation, which is influenced by the by temperature and humidity. Uh, in addition, there are other factors that affect the, 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 the viability of the viruses, such as the pH, the salinity, uh, UV, etc. 
Um, and then lastly, on the, on the reception side of the transmission cycle, the infectious dose of the virus is important. It was already mentioned before. Uh, this is the number of infectious virus particles that is needed to infect a new individual. Um, so for example, for influenza viruses, we know that approximately three to five infectious virus particles are enough to start a new infection in a new host. Um, but there's also two papers out there that now suggest that you need on average 1,000 infectious virus particles for SARS-2 uh, to start a productive infection in a new host. So that also depends on the virus. Um, then the infection site, the virus needs to land at the right spot of the respiratory tract, of course, where cells are present that can be infected. Uh, then then pre-existing immunity can play a role uh, as a result of a previous infection or vaccination. And then a susceptibility of individuals to an infection can be different also, for example, um, because of underlying conditions. And all these factors together, uh, and there's, there's actually more, uh, they are different for the different respiratory viruses, and that makes it very hard to investigate uh, the transmissibility of these viruses. Um, to illustrate that there is indeed still a need, um, that there's uh, indeed still a lot of debate and, and actually confusion about the transmission routes of these respiratory viruses, uh, we previously summarized the isolation guidelines for 10 respiratory virus infections from different national uh, and international organizations, and they are shown on the x-axis. Uh, and we compared that to the experimental evidence on transmission routes that is available. Um, on the y-axis is indicated if those guidelines aim to prevent transmission via direct or indirect contact uh, via large droplets or via small, uh, small aerosols. Um, if we then look, look at uh, uh, three very well-known respiratory viruses, so parainfluenza virus, uh, rhinoviruses, and human coronaviruses. So before SARS-CoV-2 emerged, we already had four uh, human coronaviruses in the human population. Uh, then we see that all the symbols are scattered over these panels, meaning that there are no guidelines at all, uh, or that agreement on transmission routes is lacking. Um, this is likely due to, to limited uh, experimental evidence. Um, so now I would like to go into the kind of experimental uh, virological data that can be obtained for respiratory virus transmission. And uh, one of them is by using animal transmission models. Uh, so soon after sars cov two emerged, uh, it became clear that ferrets, uh, among other animal models, uh, are susceptible for sars cov two infection. Uh, and luckily, we already had the ferret transmission set up uh, up running for for the last uh, ten years for influenza viruses. Uh, so we also use this model for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, first experiments show that SARS-CoV-2 could indeed be transmitted via direct contact or over a short distance via the air. Um, but later research that is shown here showed that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses could also be transmitted over a longer distance of, uh, of one meter. Uh, so in this exper experimental setup, you can see in the, the bottom case, there's a donor ferret and that this animal was infected by SARS-CoV-2 intranasally. Uh, one day later, we put a recipient, uh, indirect recipient animal in the top cage. Uh, there's a modest airflow from, from a donor ferret to the uh, recipient animal. And then we just collect swaps from these animals uh, every other day to see, well, basically if the uh, indirect recipient at the top uh, uh, became infected. And indeed we did it with four of these donor recipient pairs and in two out of four pairs, uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmitted. Um, and of course, it's not surprising that we see transmission in this model since our uh, results in the ferret problem model uh, resemble uh, what was also observed during the outbreaks on mink farms where SARS-CoV-2 spread very efficiently. Um, so the minks and, and ferrets belong to the same uh, family of uh, mustelids. So from these ferret transmission studies, we, we learned now that SARS-CoV-2 is stable enough to remain infectious in the air when it was transported over a distance uh, longer than one meter. Uh, but we should be careful that direct uh, extrapolation of the efficiency of transmission that we observed in the ferret model to the humans is, uh, is not possible. Um, so in, in addition to the animal models, um, also air samplers can be used to quantify the amount of virus that is present in the air, as was shown uh, in the first presentation as well. Um, however, this is still very challenging. And recently we have compared several of these air samplers. Um, the first one is a biosampler and has a bit the same uh, collection method as the Coriolis from uh, the presentation of uh, Mariette. And it's based on, on the, well, liquid impingement. So air comes in at the top and aerosols end up in one of the three nozzles at the bottom where they get accelerated. Uh, particles leave the nozzles at high velocity and they get impinged into swirling uh, liquid collection medium. 
Um, the second air sampler is the Anderson Cascade Impactor. So this is a version that we use consists of six stages, each containing a petri dish uh, with collection medium. And in our experiments, we used semi-solid gelatin as a collection medium. I will not go uh, in the, into the technical details, but an advantage of this sampler is that it size fractionates uh, the particles with the larger droplets ending up in the first stage and the smaller aerosols ending up in the, in the last stage. So uh, with these samplers, you can actually say something about the size of the droplets and the aerosols that contain the virus. Um, as a third option, we use the in-house developed uh, electrostatic precipitator. Uh, this, this glass chamber contains a corona wire at the top. You can probably not see it, but um, this corona wire produces positive ions. Um, so when the uh, aerosols enter the glass chamber, they get positively charged and they are attracted by the neutral collection medium at the bottom. Um, so to evaluate the collection efficiency of these uh, different samplers, um, we, we, we build a setup with the class two by safety cabinet uh, in which we use an airtight chamber, uh, which is the Nalgene gene box here in which a virus suspension was aerosolized using a nebulizer. Uh, the chamber was then, uh, then connected via a tube to, to either one of the, the air samplers, uh, which is connected to a vacuum pump that operated at a rate that is specific for, for each of those samplers. And here in the results, you can see that we, we tested, tested these three samplers with the H101 influenza virus and with human metanuma virus on the right. Um, and if you then compare the, the amount of aerosolized virus in blue, and you compare it with the amount of uh, collected virus in red, then you can actually see that the, the impinger and the impactor uh, were quite efficient in collecting uh, infectious virus uh, from the air. Now, unfortunately, our own uh, electrostatic uh, pre precipitator that uh, that we call the art vector based on, uh, on art the guy who designed it uh, unfortunately it worked uh, less efficient um, but the collection of infectious virus using the impinger and impactor was was uh, efficient but uh, in, in the in the in vitro setup uh, but unfortunately these samplers have a detection limit of 500 to 600 nanometers uh, and of course, uh, a virus of 100 nanometer can easily fit in a 500 nanometer uh, aerosol. So therefore, we wanted to improve the collection of these uh, submicron uh, particles uh, based on the, uh, on the collisional growth method. So this basically means that aerosols are actively enlarged before uh, collection uh, in the air sample. And this is how we did do it. So if you mix um, aerosolized virus with vaporized water in a mixing chamber, then the particles, uh, they collide and they merge into bigger aerosols. And these enlarged aerosols can then uh, be uh, collected more easily uh, by the samplers that we use. Um, so this collisional growth method was then uh, evaluated in, in a bit of a different in vitro setup. Um, so on the right side, you can see a box with water and uh, that contains ultrasonic mist makers that, that are normally used in, uh, in humidifiers. Uh, and mist from this box was then blown into the 3D printed mixing chamber that you can see at the top, uh, where it was mixed with the air that contained uh, aerosolized viruses. And in this experiment, the, the, the aerosolized viruses came from a circular tube that you can see on the left side, in which the virus was aerosolized and circulated by a built-in vent ventilator. Uh, and in this way, we can circulate viruses for different lengths of time, and we can study how this affects uh, the virus stability and infectivity. And using this setup with, with a mist maker and mixing chamber, we, we uh, could indeed improve the collection of infectious virus in this uh, system. Um, so in addition to the physics experiments uh, and, and uh, that we showed to saw today and, and the epidemiological studies, um, I've showed that uh, some, well, I showed some experimental models that can be used to study uh, also the virological side of the transmission process of uh, respiratory viruses. Uh, so of course we have animal models available. Uh, they are very valuable and they're available for, for several uh, different respiratory viruses. Uh, but I think in the near future, um, the, the, these animal models need to be combined with in vitro experiments that also cover uh, well, the three phases of the transmission cycle that I explained uh, before. Um, so, so these techniques, um, so for, for, for example, on, on the donor side, we can, uh, we can generate aerosols and droplets, and we can see if the stability of viruses and aerosols or droplets are different. So we can also use uh, sprays there that, that, that produce monodisperse or, or heterogeneous uh, uh, clouds, and, and we can see if that is uh, affecting the, the viability of the virus. 
Um, then we can simulate the environment in the in vitro setup that I just showed, in which we can circulate viruses for um, uh, a predefined period of time. Uh, there we can look at the effect of uh, salinity of mucus. We can we can of course play around with the temperature and the humidity, uh, and we can see if evaporation also affects the viability of uh, of viruses in the air. Then on the recipient side, uh, we I think we need we need still new and, and better air samplers that better. Uh, um, um, contain the uh, infection, infection, infectiousness of the virus. So all methods that are out there now are quite harsh for the virus, and, and it's very uh, well uh, difficult to to keep your uh, viruses viable. Uh, we can also well mimic uh, recipients, uh, individuals by uh, air liquid interface cultures that contain primary uh, respiratory epithelial cells. Um, we can then also study uh, what, the, what the role is of mucus. So, of course, viruses first need to penetrate mucus before they can infect those cells. Um, and hopefully that will get uh, some information on the infectious dose that is needed uh, to infect a new uh, individual. Um, well, so like I said, all respiratory viruses can be airborne. Uh, the relative contribution of airborne uh, versus contact transmission is, is highly uh, variable. Um, I guess that knowledge on the combination of virus shedding kinetics and the stability in the air and the infectious dose will help to determine the likelihood of transmission via the air. Um, animal transmission models are useful to assess the possibility to be transmitted via the air. Uh, it will help us to gain functional understanding of airborne transmission, uh, but we have to be very careful with the extrapolation to humans. So for some viruses it may work, uh, but for others not. Um, but at least those animal models, they provide a sensitive model to study uh, intervention strategies. Um, and for the future, we really need to uh, develop more elegant uh, air sample methods um, to ensure that we can, uh, well, to ensure the survival of collected viruses. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, well, all the people that in one way or the other contributed to these uh, studies and the funding agencies, uh, of course. And I again apologize for my messy uh, start of the presentations. No, it was wonderful, Sander. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, indeed, in view of the time, we will not uh, do the questions now because I think that we should go straight to the roundtable uh, discussion for which we have still about 30 minutes left. Uh, but before I do that, I should like to thank all the speakers for their very inspired talks. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you can see that people get so excited by the research that, that uh, it is hard to stop talking sometimes, but they managed. Um, okay, so um, then uh, the, as I said before, uh, in the round table discussion, we will be joined by Rul Coutinho, uh, and, and he is Emeritus Professor of Epidemiology and Infectious Diseases at Utrecht University Medical Center. Uh, Rul Coutinho is an expert in, in epidemiology and infectious diseases. He was uh, head of the uh, uh, health services in Amsterdam in the 1980s and played a key role in the strategy to suppress the spread of AIDS. Between 2005 and 2013, he was the head of infectious diseases division of the Dutch National Institute for Public Health, the RIVM CEB. And he is the author of a very recent book about vaccination called VAX. Um, and uh, I, I should, and, and the thing is that during the round table, we will we we'll listen to a number of things. We'll listen to some of the questions and some other points that have been raised. Um, but uh, I should start, I'd like to start with Rul Coutinho. Uh, in the run up to this meeting, Rul said to me several times, I am no expert on aerosols and things like that. Uh, and that may be true, but Rul is an expert on infectious diseases and epidemiology. And, it's, uh, and he's therefore in uniquely qualified to place today's discussion in the broader context. Uh, because after all, airborne transmission is but one aspect of our fight against the pandemic. So Roel, uh, I would be very interested to hear what you have to say about your impressions and recommendations. That's a very difficult task, Dan, but thanks for the information. And uh, I think that, that what, I, what I find fascinating, I haven't seen the presentations in, 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 in advance, um, I'm very impressed with all the knowledge that have been uh, have been collected and is available. 
And of course, the problem of is how to translate it is in practical issues. And um, what I find most convincing is after listening to all the presentation and reading the different presentations, it is pretty clear that indeed we do not know exactly what plays the highest role in the transmission, but that aerosols do play a role that is at least highly likely. And then it is quite, quite surprising to read the statement of the uh, our National Institute of Public Health, who says that, uh, I have it here somewhere, that it is not clear how, whether aerosols play a role. And that's interesting to see such a statement because of course the, you can't make such a statement because you have to stay to stay in the precautionary uh, principle. And of course it should be taken to account this kind of information that there is good evidence for that, uh, for that transmission. And although you never know how important it is and you probably whatever studies you are doing, you will never find out uh, how exactly important that will be. It is uh, important to take that into account. Now, um, that statement of the Public Health the, uh, uh, Institute is not on its own. Um, we are li living in a very strange country because we are one of the few countries where the discussion on masks has been extended unbelievably strange because people have said from the beginning they do not play a role in helping to 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 uh to, uh, for transmission so they're not uh, protecting which is something when you look at the data already some time ago which was completely uh, unfounded and so um, I think what is what makes it interesting for people who control infectious diseases is how do they look at uh, the measures. And it is, one of the speakers already said that we were put on the wrong leg from the beginning on because, uh, because of the experience with SARS, everyone thought that uh, transmission would only happen with symptomatic disease. In reality, the first uh, signal of that came already out of Germany end of January, but it took months for people to accept that pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission played a role. So apparently it's not only science that convinced people, it is a lot of psychology which plays a role. And how do you uh, convince people to be introspective and accept that they may be wrong and that they have to do something else? Now, I don't want to, to dwell too long because I think that uh, there were surely a lot of uh, scientific discussions will happen. I just want to say something on uh, what Dan said that um, uh, this recent article in, in The Lancet, which said that um, we, uh, if we even if we are vaccinating at a large scale, um, we shouldn't think that we can immediately leave the other measures out of our control. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I like models, but I distrust them heavily. Uh, because there are so many things that are uh, difficult to, to estimate. For example, um, uh, how well does the, do the vaccines, uh, uh, what role do they play in the transmission? How, what role do they play in asymptomatic disease? There are a lot of examples of that. Think about polio vaccine. I don't want to go into the details, but the polio vaccine, there was a long discussion about the SOC vaccine that it didn't play a role at all in transmission in helping to, to, to curb the transmission, which in the end turned out not to be true. But anyway, so there is a lot of issues here. The only um, thing which is an advantage of our very slow progression in vaccination, which is what we are, we started low, uh, late and we are still slow as all, all of the Europe for a lot of reasons. We have one advantage that other do, countries are doing much better. And so we can look at what's happening in a country like Israel and see at the moment that the number of infections is dramatically uh, dropping, uh, which is, a, 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 I would say, a, an experiment in practice and apparently shows what's going to happen. Of course, we don't know, but we can look at what other countries are doing and that we can, look at, can learn from their experience what the impact of vaccinations is and still um, I think it will be huge, but I'm going back to the aerosol discussions. I think that that one of the remarks was was a, was a very interesting one that you can measure quite easily. We see uh, CO two um, uh, the, the presence 
uh, and measuring that what the contamination in the in the air is and i think that that's probably underused so i will leave it with that and i'm looking forward to uh, what other people have uh, in uh, in the discussion down well thank you very much rule um, actually i think that your your last few uh, comments connect immediately to other questions that have been raised in the q in the q and a session and uh, in particular uh, it is this whole thing about uh, well, we heard many times that ventilation is really important. We heard about uh, proxies for measuring viral spread, like measuring carbon dioxide. And at the same time, when you look at policies, uh, at the moment, to my knowledge, uh, public spaces are not asked to indicate in any way on the outside uh, whether they, what their carbon dioxide concentration is or translated in a, in a unit that people will, will, will understand, like safe or unsafe, or or the ventilation rates. I mean, and we know that you have to treat these numbers uh, carefully, but I would like to ask in particular uh, from Kath and Howard, what, what they feel about uh, how people should be informed about the safety of different spaces. Can, are there things that we can use as a imperfect, but a, as a probe for uh, whether it's, if a space is relatively safe or unsafe? Maybe I, guess if you kick. I don't mind. I'm going to go first. So yeah. I think CO2 is a is a good proxy measure, um, but I think it has to be done with care. So um, I mean, the, the the amount the the value that you measure will depend on the age of the person, the um, activity that they're doing, their metabolic rate. Um, uh, it will depend on the meter that you're using and its accuracy. Um, it will fluctuate quite a lot. It will depend on whether you measure it, whether it's the space is well mixed or not. So I think we have to be quite careful about setting values and how we use those values. And I think some of the reluctance comes from the fact that once you start measuring, people then go, well, what is safe? And they demand a safe figure. And I don't think we know what a safe number is. I think we can give some, some ideas as to what is better or worse. And we can certainly say, this is poor, do something about it. Um, but I think people then equate it with a standard and it becomes very difficult. And of course, what do you do if you've got a public building and you've set that you know green is 800 parts per million and that public building goes to 850, what happens at that point? Do, do we get everybody out? Do we, uh, you then need a process for what you do. Um, and at what point does it, does do, going over the threshold, does it actually matter? What point's in the noise and what point's actually important? So I think it is, I think it's useful, but I think what we actually then need is a public discussion about how you use those numbers and how you don't treat them as hard numbers and standards, but you use them as indicators and guidance and allow people to manage their spaces better i i i can see this point very uh, howard what, what would you would you like to add something to this point uh, i had only add i mean kath is uh, an expert and i agree yeah. with everything she said i'd only add that uh co2 has been used as a a measure in the buildings literature for i think quite a long time and i think kath has put her finger on an important question, how do we use it? But I think it is a measure of air quality because we do have data that says, I think Kath is the one who highlighted this first, outdoors is known to be safer. So therefore, if you have a reliable measurement, a few sensors in a room, I, I'm no expert, but I think this is not an unreasonable thing for people to start to think towards. And I know there are groups yeah. thinking about it. If you're closer to outdoor air quality, then almost by definition, you you at least are aware that your room has uh, more fresh air in it, and and that has to be better. But as Kath pointed out, how do you use it in general? You have to know something about the space, the number of people in space, etc. But I I don't see in the absence of any information, this is information that will help us at least as individuals think about the safety, the, the risk of the space that we're in. I mean, and that also, I think, relates to what Rule was saying about the precautionary principle. Yes, the information we have is imperfect, but is that, I mean, so, because you can always say more study is needed, but with this pandemic, in many cases, we don't have all that much time to do more study. So there, there may be situations where you, you, you give the information and say, it doesn't mean necessarily that a particular level is safe, 
but if you, for instance, can show measurements for, I mean, uh, what the, the CO2 concentration in the pub where people are singing inside compared to what happens if they, they, they're talking outside in the sidewalk cafe, th these numbers might help people to make a choice. I mean, that, this, this I, I think we should be a bit more careful about dismissing things because the, the science is not yet rock solid. I mean, we should not go to fake science, but we... So um, in, in, in some countries, in fact, yes. you do uh, measurements uh, have been installed also in parts of Germany, in pro certain provinces, in classrooms, they measure CO2 yeah. uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, use CO2 uh, as an indication when to do ventilation. So this, I mean, what surprises me most is how different countries react uh, and... Uh, I mean, the virus is basically the same, well, apart from mutants, which, which came up, but I mean, basically it's the same, but the measures which are taken and how seriously this is taken, this varies quite a bit from country to country. At the beginning, I think one could see a correlation with the infection numbers, well, but now it's too complex to, to do that, but uh, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's amazing how different countries react differently and what is totally accepted in one country is not accepted in the other. This, this really yeah. amazes me because as a scientist, we are, of course, used to international exchange and contact, but this seems to be different for the pandemic. I, I, I can actually, in, in, connecting to this point, uh, uh, left, uh, one thing that is very different uh, between a number of countries and, for instance, Germany, and particularly Bavaria, is the use of uh, air purifiers in classrooms. And I saw in Sanderstock, in, the, in the, the beautiful sketch of the equipment he showed, at the very end, before it went to the pump, there was a HEPA filter. And, and so I assume that you, that you put the HEPA filter as a kind of protection or, or, I mean, do you think that HEPA filters, when you circulate air through them, actually make a difference? And, and whether we should consider this also in certain places like classrooms, like they do in Bavaria? And <clears throat> well, so indeed, we put our HEPA filter there because uh, the, the air um, is going through the pump and the pump is outside our class two cabinet. So indeed, right. here, so, assume that uh, well, the viruses that we are uh, aerosolizing, that they uh, do end up in our HEPA filters. Uh, so, because after all, I mean, you, you, oh, maybe Kath, you want to say something? So I, mean, I think, again, HEPA filter devices and air cleaning devices, there is there is a, an argument for using them, definitely. Um, I think you wouldn't necessarily use them everywhere. Um, no. You know, there's this law of diminishing returns on your on your ventilation. So putting a, a HEPA filter air cleaner into a well-ventilated space probably has very little effect. But in spaces where you can't ventilate well, they might be an effective solution. I think, again, you just have to be careful how you use them in that they're no magic bullet. They, uh, one of the challenges you've got is that what you might do is it, it recirculates the air locally around the HEPA filter device. So you end up with a very nice clean zone of air very, very close to it, but can it do the other side of the room? So we have to then think about the room airflow as to how much of that goes through yeah. the unit. Well, um, the, the, the other thing I was, been, I'd like to hear your comments on that too, is, is that, uh, I mean, Detlef showed that depending on the, the uh, circulation in the, in, the, in the room, there may be safe circulation, uh, ventilation rates and, and less, less safe ventilation rates. And, and I, you basically saw the similar thing. Um, now, the, the, uh, the, 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 the thing I was wondering is, at home, people cannot easily place a HEPA filter. At least for most people, that will be out of, out of the question. But many houses have a kitchen with an exhaust fume over the stove, over the, stove, over the, over the, the, the cooking, over the, the fume exhaust. Some of them will circulate inside, they're useless, but some of them circulate outside, they pump the air outside. Is that something that people should be using at home? I, I think they should always be using them at home because no. actually <laughs> forget, forget about COVID, they, 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 we should be using them to prevent um, uh, poor air quality in kitchens. Yeah, um, well, sure, but that's when you're cooking. But for instance, yeah. if, that, if, there's, if, if a plumber comes to fix something in your house, you're not very sure about whether this person is infected. I mean, switch on the, uh, the, the switch exhaust. Switch on and open the window. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I think that practical suggestions that don't harm anybody actually are extremely useful. Um, there, there were actually a lot of questions about super spreading events. And... and uh, uh, I mean, whether a, a super spreader is a person uh, with who, who, who just happens to, ex to exhale more 
uh, viral la loaded, uh, loaded droplets or whether it's person at peak viral load, which is like the, the one or two days before the, the symptoms, if, if at all, and, and one or two days after, or it's a combination of the two. But I have one other question that I, I would like to ask in particular to the Groningen team. And uh, because uh, Alex mentioned explicitly this, uh, this thing about the over dispersion. And I, I mean, maybe because it's a technical term, I will try to explain in my own words what over dispersion means. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, email and you, you look on Wikipedia how much spam there is, 80% of all email is spam. Uh, does that mean that all of us send five, four out of five emails that we send is on average spam? That we, we hopefully that's not true. So what basically happens is that most of us send no spam at all. Some people may disagree, but most of us send no spam at all. And some people send tens of thousands. That's an extreme case of over dispersion. Now, I mentioned this because uh, that kind of over dispersion is only possible because of the mode, mode of tra transmission, namely internet. Now, the question is the fact that SARS-CoV-2 has an over dispersion such that, that the, 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 the basically the, the variation in the number of viruses is about an order of magnitude higher than the average. Does that tell us something about the mode of transmission? And then of course you can start talking about whether airborne transmission is a more likely candidate or not. So I, 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 this is some, a question that I thought Alex and, and Mariette might be willing to discuss. I'm happy to take this question, thank you. Um, I think here is important to to, because we, we, are, we are looking into transmission ways between two individuals, for example. But the reality of infectious disease is that we have to look into behavior, social behavior of the population of Homo sapiens, <laughs> let's say like this, because it is a continuous contact and moving of those individuals that then by contact or whatever, or of course aerosol, can then transmit from one individuum to the other. But from the viral point of view. Um, it is important to understand what is the reality of social behavior uh, and where is the most contact and where can um, such um, uh, over dispersion events, so super spreading events um, occur continuously day and night and then see um, where are the moments where the people have also their, their, their peak of viral load. If this come together, then you have a problem. So the, the reality, comes to in a nutshell to the point that the reality is that the driver of this um, uh, pandemic or epidemic on a local level um, is, is not that the R value is 2.5. That is just the overall mean R value over the whole society. But that's not important from my point of view. Reality is this, what is the specific R value within different um, networks that exist? And for example, the healthcare network, the working network, the school network, they have specific R values that are like at five times, 10 times higher. And there it happens. And if there also aerosol becomes relevant, um, it might be in the, in the total of the whole situation on the street and the supermarket, not so relevant. But if it happens in the nursing home, in the hospitals continuously, then you get a problem. Mm -hmm. And it is... Um, then really a, re um, a reality on the whole scale. So that I think we do not look into the reality of the spreading um, uh, if we say it is uh, um, uh, like 2.5 uh, is the R value in the whole society. It's, uh, we, we underestimate the possibility of, of super spreading or even hyper spreading. I, I think Can I add how, something, Howard, Dan? Can I, I add something? Yeah, uh, sure. But I thought Howard first raised his hand. Then, oh, then okay. sorry, sorry. No, no, sure. Howard. No, I had my ha hand raised on a. Oh, previous... wait, 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 oh, okay, okay, sorry, rule. <laughs> I, I started my career in smallpox eradication, which is a long time ago. And for you, most of you, that's history. I worked in Bangladesh at a time in smallpox eradication, and smallpox is, is also transmitted through the air. And what's interesting there is that 
I worked at the moment that there was hunger in Bangladesh. It was a very bad situation. And smallpox patients tended to sit in, in, in very crowded railway stations because then they could get more money because they were beggars. And what's so amazing, which I learned from that experience, is that in one situation, you may have no one who gets infected by that beggar. No one. And the other situations, there were hundreds of people infected. And the problem is that it is so complex because it has to do with behavior. It has to do with the amount of virus. It has to do with a lot of other things. So, yes, there are super spreading events and they are either persons or situations. They are well known for all infectious diseases. And it is impossible, in my view, to predict when it will happen as a super spreader or super spreading event. It's impossible. There are too many problems there. Okay, no, that's a very, very important. Cassia, you want to add something? I think that's probably true of just about all respiratory diseases as well. And I think we also make an assumption that yeah. once somebody's got it, they're emitting it continually. I yeah, don't yeah, think no, they do. I think no, sometimes yeah. people emit and sometimes they don't. And if you catch them at the right moment, you're the unlucky one. Now Howard has a question. Well, now I just want to make a remark because of um, the recent discussion. You wanted to think about ideas. One idea that hasn't been discussed today because you were asking, you know, physical scientists for their interpretation of what's going on, but that definitely relates to this idea of super spreading and, and trying to uh, mitigate it is rapid testing. And um, we've largely not been successful at that, but it is something that perhaps we'll get better at because yeah. that could identify some of the people who might be uh, potential super spreaders before they have too much of an impact. I, I, I quickly want to still go through a few questions from the, from the, the, the Q&A. Uh, one is the, uh, the question whether the, the current measurements still hold for the new variants. I mean, the, and, and actually, uh, I want to slide, put it in a slightly broader context, and that is, uh, are the things that we are learning now, are they really sufficiently preparing us for the next pandemic that will surely come? Who would like to say something about that? I mean, it, it's... Uh, I can, I, I, I yeah. can say something about, for, on the variants. So just my experience on, the, on our recent outbreak we had, we had no really outbreaks till the point that the UK variant come in. We didn't mm -hmm. change anything, but then something was different although we used masks and everything and uh, it needs to do it, it, it has from our point of view what we saw now to do that um, there is a, a, a faster generation time higher loads in an earlier stage uh, and maybe the infectious dose is even lower it uh, so it's impressive to see that these variants can have a very different but it's more complex not only one parameter that is different. And to your question, um, are we prepared for the next uh, pandemic? So I would say we are not even prepared for the one we are now in, um, uh, uh, really. So we have to really get very fast to the point that we will tackle this down. And of course, vaccination is the solution. But till we get down, we have a window of problems still ahead. Uh, and then some things needs to be changed because it was very important. I think uh, what all the colleagues said, but Detlef said something very important. It is just ridiculous um, that we think that we can, on the scale of a member state, combat such a thing as a pandemic. It's just impossible. On a continental scale, we might have the critical mass. And what we need is a kind of, um, um, uh, not European collaboration, but the European um, um, uh, 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 approach would need a, a, um, a, um, a, a homeland biosecurity organization that brings all these things together because then one country says no mask, other country makes no sense, really no sense. I, uh, at least personally, I would very strongly support your statement because I, I, I thought last March that we would have something like a, a COVID Manhattan project, but we haven't had it. Um, I have one question about uh, the, 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 the thing that mentioned, I think Daniel mentioned about the infectious dose. And I, I, I know this is actually a very questionable concept, but uh, uh, Ron Fouché asked if it's true that the, 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 the Kedit is very hard, high dose of about a thousand particles, and I'm not sure whether it's particles or variants, uh, then uh, may, maybe then uh, airborne transmission over large distances is less important. Maybe Daniel or Detlef would like to comment on that. 
Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, sure. Uh, so th that is that is the million dollar question, right? So what what is what is an infectious dose? Uh, what is clear from our measurements is that there's a million times more virus in the large droplets than in the small droplets. Yeah. So if you need to be in contact sure. with a large number of uh, of virus particles, then of course uh, you you. You, you would need uh, to inhale many aerosol droplets before falling ill. Yeah, but if you have a super shedder who is also a super spreader, uh, that might still happen. Maybe Mariette wants to say a bit something. I mean, you're the, the person who works with this every day. But you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I had to go to the unmute uh, button. Um, yeah, I agree what uh, Dania says about when you uh, have aerosols, you need more um, aerosols to, to, to get infected with the, uh, with the virus. Um, I still think that is, uh, that is possible, actually, uh, especially when there is, um, uh, actually what Dania said, there, um, uh, there are people who are spreading it a lot, and I think especially in the um, in the, the starting phase of, uh, of uh, an infection, especially in the, in the phase where someone is maybe even asymptomatic. Um, and in the beginning, when they are begin to be, to be symptomatic, I think uh, that's the, the, the part where people uh, are spreading most and it is possible to, um, um, to spread it by aerosols to other people, I, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's one thing about maybe about the number of, of various particles per droplet, and that is that um, uh, at least there were in the early stages of the pandemic some, some preprints that partly never saw the, the light of day, where it was suggested that the very small droplets, like the one to two micron droplets, actually are much more dangerous, a bit like tuberculosis, because they could land directly in the lungs. But uh, I think that, as far as I can tell, we don't really know much more about these. Certainly, I don't know much more about that than what was written half a year ago, but maybe again. Alex, yes. You know, the interesting thing in SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, uh, is that you see that people that have really no symptoms, they have uh, already, they can have already enormous yeah. uh, amounts. It depends, of course, on uh, the measure that uh, the use, the method you use to measure enormous amounts of viruses. So uh, incredible high amounts of viruses without any symptoms. So the interesting thing is, of course, if you then you are coughing, it's more easy to get that out. But it's also without any, we have seen that also by data um, uh, uh, from the colleagues, also without any symptoms, you see that there, there is enough aerosol not only, but there are also, and we see that from our um, uh, experience in the hospital, enough viruses in the air at that moment because it's a so high concentration. And that then there might be the infectious dose is not so low, but if, if you have so many viruses uh, in, in, the, in the moment of contact, then it makes no difference. And it is uh, astonishing, and maybe it's the fact of the, that it's first time in Homo sapiens, that in this first one or two years, you see those phenomena. Maybe later in 2022 and 23, it will be different than for the infectious disease COVID. But now it's still relevant. You see that no symptoms, enormous amounts of viruses. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just comment on that as yes, well? Please. Because I think I, when it comes to modeling, which is, I mean, a lot of us here do try and model this, I think there are actually two relationships that are important. So one is the relationship between infectious virus and viral RNA, because nearly all of the measurements that have been done, which we use as some form of guide, have been viral RNA rather than actual infectious virus. And then, of course, there is the actual dose response. So how much virus do you need to cause infection? Uh, and it may be that you, it's, it, you know, you need a thousand RNA particles, <laughs> but actually you only need five or ten virus particles, live virus particles. And we don't know. And we know that those relationships are not stable. They vary. Um, so it's actually quite difficult to work out. There is in the UK, there are some human challenge studies starting. Um, I hope <laughs> it's supposed to be. Uh, and I think one of the things that they will tell us at least give an indication as to what that infectious dose needs to be, which I think it would be really interesting to see what that shows us. Thank you. I mean, a very last comment by Howard, and then unfortunately we'll have to see Howard, yes. Well, I, I just wanted to add, but maybe this is obvious 
to everyone, but given that we don't know this information, but you want suggestions for how to lower risk, one is ventilation, but in the absence of controlling that, it's air purifiers, which help. They can't, I don't think they can hurt. Uh, how well they'll work will depend on features of the room. And two, reducing contact time, because whatever the dose is, you will reduce how much you get in if when you're sharing air spaces with people, you reduce the time you're there. That might not be a nice thing to say, but it is a quantitative fact that follows from the kinds of models that Kath and others are saying. I, I'm afraid that we have reached the, the end of our session. I, I found it an incredibly interesting set of presentation, incredibly interesting discussion. Uh, I, I think that we also came up with a few messages that, that hopefully people will be able to ponder about. And and, 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 and and the other thing that is very, very clear is that there's a lot of research needed and it's a research that really is at the interface of the different disciplines. And I think it what makes it extremely exciting if we talk to each other and listen to each other. Um, I'd like to speak to thank all the speakers and, and, and panelists. Uh, I also would like to thank the, uh, the, the audience for their uh, incredible patience, uh, because most of them are still there. And uh, uh, I think that here I, I would love, like to close the session. I thank the KNW again for their hospitality. Thank you very much and bye bye. Thank you, Dan. Bye. -bye.